excellent. So again, thank you for taking over for me yesterday. Very good. And that's one thing which I was always emphasizing that I make sure when I speak, I try and say I'm not stressing this point, I'm emphasizing it, because stress has no part in Buddhism. But <laughs> sometimes you say you're a follower of Ajahn Brahm, but really that's not correct. We only take refuge in three things, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha not one particular monk or nun. I always feel that that's quite dangerous because that means that sometimes you prefer, you may prefer one person's teachings over another, but it doesn't mean you don't go listening to other teachers to get a wider idea and understanding of what Buddhism is. And if one just follows one teacher, it can be really narrow-minded. I still recall when I was a student, one of the first things I was told when I went up to Cambridge University was that, yes, you're supposed to be studying maths and physics, what we call theoretical physics, but nevertheless, in a university like Cambridge, you have so many amazing minds, great lecturers, people with so much knowledge, don't just go to lectures in your field, go to other lecturers, get a wider education, make it broader and broader, and that means you become wiser and wiser. And don't think because it's something like, say, architecture, that's got nothing to do with theoretical physics. Sometimes you can combine things where people have never thought it was possible before. And that's one of the reasons why one of my stories is you know, when I did give that talk over the keynote address at the World Computer Conference a few years ago in South Korea, and I did, and when they asked me, what am I doing there? I'm not a computer geek, I'm a Buddhist monk, a meditator. And that's when one of the things I told them was, I think, 2000, sorry, 1910 or something, or 18 or whatever, I'm not quite sure when, the St. Louis World's Fair. At that World's Fair, like everywhere else, they had to have these stalls selling food. And it just happened by chance that the person selling ice cream was situated right next to the person selling waffles. You know, the breakfast, um, American breakfast waffles, you put, um, uh, what's it called, maple syrup on. They were just together for days during this world's fair and they started talking together. And when they were talking together, they decided to cooperate. And from that world's fair, and just the chance of the guy selling ice cream being next to the guy selling waffles, they decided to combine waffle and ice cream. It was called the ice cream cone. And that's where it was invented. Just two people from different, same, different foodstuffs cooperating. And that's why I always feel that don't just say you're a disciple of Ajahn Brahm. Say you're a disciple of Ajahn Brahm and Venerable Kaisi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite sure which one of us is the ice cream, which one is the waffle. <laughs> but when we work together, we get so much further. These are examples of thy inside which comes. And when one goes around to many temples in Penang, sees different teachers, if it's a good teacher, they won't say, oh, don't go to him, he's hopeless, don't go to her, she's terrible. They always say that take the best of what they offer. It's like a buffet. Now, I... Venerable Kaisi and I eat at Mahindarama Temple. And they put so much food on those tables. There's no way in the world you can eat all that food. Even if you liked it, you always leave most of it. But the point is, it's a buffet, even on your own table. You can take some of this, and maybe take some of that, leave some of that. 
add it all together and you get some really interesting new tastes. One of the things we discovered in Northeast Thailand, I must say that I think you can buy this in shops now, when you had ice cream you always had um, sticky rice with it as well. And these days, I'm not sure why in the West they haven't discovered that yet. Now, ice cream with sticky rice is much more delicious than ice cream by itself. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> because now the people who feed me are going to get me that. I have to be very careful expressing the sort of foods which I can digest. I learned that in the north of Thailand once when I told the people supporting me there was only a few people supporting me. I was in a monastery all by myself, no one else there at all, very peaceful. And then one day they gave me some, I think, fried bananas in batter. So oh, that's very nice. I shouldn't have said that. Because <laughs> the next day, that's all I got. No rice, no vegetables, no curry, nothing except just fried bananas. And when I first saw that, I thought, wow, I could just eat fried bananas today, one meal a day, and I did. My goodness, I was sick. <laughs> but it taught me a lesson. It taught me a lesson. Is sometimes you, know, you do need to have balance, a balanced diet, and also a balance in your teachings, what you hear from others. And if you have that balance, and it's a good balance, you should do very well. It doesn't mean you have to accept everything. You find what works for you. When you find what works for you, you know it works for you because it leads to peace, insight, having fewer things, fewer attachments. That is one of the topics which I gave over in Singapore the weekend before last. So how do we know what is Dhamma? How do we know what is real? How do we know what you know, is added on? Because sometimes people think that it's good to add it on. How do we know what's real Buddhism? And the answer was the advice which the Buddha gave to you know, his uh, uh, foster mother, um, no, sorry, not foster mother, yeah, foster mother, uh, Mahapajapati. And he also repeated that to uh, Upali. He used to be, you know, his hairdresser when he was over uh, as a still a royal person. And the advice was, whatever Dhamma you hear leads to peace, the sense of freedom, things fading away, uh, to you know, things like Nibbana, to that joy, that happiness, that freedom. If that's where it leads, then you can trust that that certainly is the teachings of the Buddha. That is the Dhamma. Right? If it works for you or not. And I kind of like that because it solved one of those problems. Even uh, in my tradition, the Thai forest tradition, there were so many different teachers teaching so many different things. What was correct and what was not correct. And I remember asking Ajahn Chah that, and he said, well, look, just give it a try and see if it works. Don't always just say you're a disciple of Ajahn Chah, that you've taken refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma, and the Sangha. Not the Buddha, Dhamma, and this monk, or that nun. Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. So you can listen to many teachings and find out which ones work. And if there's any controversy, sometimes we ask them, it doesn't sound right. And Ajahn Chah would say, yes. It's right, but it's not correct. <laughs> oh, it's, it's correct, but not right. And I love the way it's like settling arguments like that. Who's right and who's wrong? And I also remember one of these Chinese stories about these two monks. They were having an argument about the Dhamma. And the argument was something like, how can you believe in rebirth? Because rebirth, it hasn't happened yet. How can you be 100% sure that rebirth is important? The other monk said, no, it's clear the Buddha taught about rebirth. You have to accept it, it's important. 
So they had an argument. How do they, how do you settle those arguments? So the first monk who said, well you can't really 100% accept rebirth because you haven't died yet. So he went to the teacher and made his explanation. The teacher said, hmm, yeah, you're right. And he was so pleased with the teacher's agreement. He went out to see the other monks. There you go. The teacher said that you, know, you don't have to believe in rebirth because you haven't died yet. So he can't have said that. So the second monk went in to see the teacher. And he said, but the Buddha always taught about rebirth. There's many, many statements. The Buddha said rebirth is true. Buddhism doesn't make sense if you don't have rebirth. And the head monk listened to that and said, hmm, yeah, you're right. So the second, the second monk went out and said, no, the teacher agreed with me. He said, I'm right. He couldn't have done. He said, I was right. So they did what they should have done in the first place. They both went in. And the first said, you know, this is what you said, that you don't have to leave, believe in rebirth. And he said, I was right. And then he said, you have to believe in rebirth. He said, he was right. And that's no good. And the teacher said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> because if your views and understandings <laughs> lead to arguments, is that really Buddhist? We don't argue with people with different ideas than we do, we just listen to them and say, oh, I think about it. And of course that's one of those words I really love. I'll think about it. Many times, because this is not quite my last day, tomorrow's my last day here. Many of you will say on my last day, when are you coming back to Penang? Can you come back next year or in three months or six months? And if I say no, I get into big trouble. And I don't say no these days. I say, I'll think about it. And I've been thinking about so many invitations to go to so many places. I never go there, but I do think about it. <laughs> <laughs> so any of you who having difficulties Know, with your relationships or having a boss at work is always telling you what to do. Don't argue. Don't say no. Just say, I'll think about it. Which you will do. You won't do it. But at least you'll think about it. And that kind of satisfies people. I shouldn't tell you those tricks. <laughs> because now if you invite me to, can you do this? Can you? I say, I'll think about it. I said, no, I jump on. I know what that means. <laughs> I have to think of another trick. <laughs> But nevertheless, that's a kind of wisdom and insight which does lead to peace in your life, leads to some happiness. And so sometimes then people ask me, you know, the Venerable Kaisi, you're, you're supposed to be Mahayana, aren't you? I'm supposed to be Theravada, aren't I? Am I? You know, sometimes there are people like to judge and then they put people in that box and that causes the problems. I know many times I've been with these great some Mahayana teachers and I said, well, what are you doing? I said, oh, you know, we're helping others. You know, and I'm supposed to be Hinayana, just meditating by myself. And I'm doing more service than they are. So you're not the Mahayana, I am just to upset them. <laughs> and I don't need to upset them, just to stir it up. Now what is Mahayana? What is Theravada? What is Vajrayana? What's the difference between them? What's the difference between monks and nuns? It's nothing to do with the gender. It's nothing to do with your tradition. It's the understanding, the wisdom that you've generated over those years of practice. And I know this is an ordinary story, but it comes up now and it's very valid for this you know, time in our world. And it was you know, the most beautiful sound in the world story. The most beautiful sound in the world story was when uh, an old man came from the mountains. His children had done really well in the city and uh, got good businesses going 
got married and they were successful. And like you always want to do, is you want to look after your mother and father who sacrificed things for you. So they invited their dad into the city for the first time. And the first day, the father heard a terrible noise, the worst sound he'd ever heard in his life. He just wanted to run away. But he was interested. Instead of just getting negative to anything, he don't follow ill will. You find out, what is that? Because sometimes the things you like to run away from are some of the things you can learn the most from. So he followed that sound to its source. And in a small room in the back of a house, he saw this young seven-year-old boy trying to play a violin. And it was disgusting, the sounds which were coming out of that violin. It would make everybody run away. But anyway, he found out what it was. Because he was a simple man, he thought all violins sound like that. But the next day, different part of the city, he heard a beautiful sound, a gorgeous sound. He followed that to its source. Many of you may have heard this uh, story before. He found that that was an old lady playing a violin. She was a maestro, been playing all her life. And it was so sweet. And he realized his mistake. You can't blame the instrument. It's a person who hasn't learned how to play it yet. And that's when he thought, that's like philosophies, that's like you know, politics, that's like religion. A lot of times we can blame the religions or the political theory or the philosophy. But isn't it the case that the person hasn't learned how to play it properly yet? And the third day, the third day he heard a sound which surpassed the beauty of a maestro playing the violin. It was the most beautiful sound he'd ever heard in his life. It surpassed the sound of the creeks up in the mountain after a heavy rain, surpassed the sound of the wind rustling the forest leaves after a, and a gentle breeze. It surpassed even the birds in the early morning singing and celebrating the dawn. The most beautiful sound in the whole world. And what was that sound? I jump around giving a talk? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, the most, the most, sorry. The most beautiful sound was the sound of an orchestra. The most beautiful sound because Every person in that orchestra, even the little man playing the, the triangle, ding, he'd been practicing for years to play that triangle. He was a maestro of the triangle. Everyone was a maestro. That was the first reason why it was a good sound. And the second reason, having become a maestro of their own instruments, then they learned how to play together in harmony. And that's why it was the most inspiring sound in the whole world. And that's one challenge which I have to give to all the monks and nuns in the world, no matter from what tradition. You're all Buddhist. There's only one Buddha. Please let us learn to be maestros of our own path. And secondly, learn how to play together in harmony. And then you'll be proud to be Buddhists. Our Buddhist teachers don't go around arguing, my meditation is deeper than yours. That's not what we do, what we do. There's no kindness in that. But of course, you know how much I love telling stories. And there's one story, I haven't told here on this trip about the most beautiful sound in the world. And that was of this Australian man. 
this Australian man on holiday was trekking in the foothills of the Himalaya mountains in a region called Ladakh. And he was also a keen photographer. So he was taking so many photographs of some of the beautiful uh, plants and flowers up in those foothills and the views as well. And he thought he could keep up with the rest of the, uh, the group, but he fell behind. And he tried to find the others and he realized he got lost. Got lost in the foothills of the Himalaya mountains. And he realized it was dangerous. They have snow leopards, bears, they have all sorts of dangerous animals up there. So he tried to find his way, but the more he tried to find his way, the more lost he became. And the sun was going down. He only had maybe an hour or so before it would be totally dark. He had no mobile phone access up there. So he started getting scared. But then, fortunately, in the distance, he saw the lights of some sort of habitation, maybe a village or something. He had no choice but to go and walk towards those lights. He managed to get there. He knocked on the door. It was a monastery, a very remote Buddhist monastery. When he knocked on the door, he told his situation. He said, yeah, it happened before. So they invited him in. The abbot was a very, very, very kind man. And he said, I know you Westerners, you can't sleep on the floor like most of us do. But I've got a bed in my office. You can sleep in that tonight. I'll give it up for one night. I don't want to do that to you. Said, no, said the other, please. No, I want to, you know. Isn't it always the case when you give to others and that some of which is yours, you always feel so much happier? So anyway, he loaned the bed to this uh, trekker and this Australian fell asleep so deeply. But then in the middle of the night, about midnight, this Australian was woken up. Nothing scary, but really amazing. He heard this sound, it's like music. Even calling it music was like demeaning it. It was the most beautiful sound he'd ever heard, ever in his life. And he'd been to the Sydney Opera House to listen to great orchestras and great singers. This was so much more beautiful, so beautiful that it made him cry. And as he was hearing it and crying, he did fall asleep. He was so tired. And in the morning, in the morning, you know, he thanked the abbot you know, for giving him a nice sleep. The abbot gave him a nice breakfast and one of the monks to take him to where the other people in the party would be so he could catch up with them. Well, the Australian couldn't help but ask. Last night, in the middle of the night, I was woken up by the most beautiful sounds I've ever heard in my whole life. What were they? And at that, the monk said, Oh, you heard that too, did you? He said, Yes, what was it? And the abbot said, Sir, I'm sorry. But I can't tell you. Why not? said the Australian. He said, because it's the law, it's a tradition. I can only let another monk know what that sound is. I can't tell lay people, only monks. He said, oh, come on. He said, no, that's our law. The previous abbot had to keep that rule. I keep that rule. We've always kept that rule. So the Australian got out his wallet and got out a couple of hundred dollar notes. Here, take this. He said, no, doesn't matter how much you give me. Okay, he said, here's a thousand dollars. Look, stop it. I cannot tell you, I will not tell you. I can only tell monks. So they argued a little bit, and then it was time for him to go and catch up with his trekking party. So off he went. 
But even the following night in a nice hotel, he couldn't get that sound out of his mind. When he got onto the plane to go back to Australia, he still couldn't forget that sound. When he came to his home and started work, he still couldn't forget that sound. It was driving him crazy, the most beautiful, amazing thing in the whole world, and he couldn't find out what it was. So it got so bad for him, he couldn't sleep. He went to see the psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist gave him some medication. That never worked. It was driving him mad. So, one year later, he went back to that monastery. And he told the abbot, look, I've been going crazy trying to figure out what that sound was, and I just still don't know. Please, you must tell me. And the abbot said, look, I told you I can only tell monks. Yes, I know. Ordain me as a monk, please. <laughs> That's how much he needed to know the origin of that sound. So the abbot said, okay, fair enough, but it will take a couple of years of training. To be a monk at Bodhinyana Monastery or a nun at Dhammasara, it takes two or three years. You know what we call that? We call that QC, quality control. <laughs> Just, so, so after two years, this Australian, he trained, he was diligent, and he did his ordination ceremony. He was now a monk. You know the first thing he said once he was a monk? Great, what was that sound? That's the main reason I became a monk, I'm not interested in Buddhism or <laughs> meditation. I need to know the origin of that sound. And the abbot said, look, I, can, I won't just tell you, I'll show you. Come to my office tonight at midnight and I will show you what makes the most beautiful sound in the whole world. So he appeared excited in the abbot's office and the abbot asked him, are you sure you really want to know? He said, yes, of course, I need to know. He said, look, this is something supernatural. Sometimes people think they want to see the supernatural, but it scares them. Some monks have gone crazy. Are you sure you can handle it? And this Australian said, look, I will go crazy if you don't show it to me. I've got nothing to lose. Okay, said the abbot. So the abbot drew aside a curtain. He'd seen that curtain many times. It never been drawn aside before. Behind that curtain there was an old oak door, ancient. And the head monk, the abbot, took out a bunch of keys. And one of those keys was made out of wood. That's how old it was. And he put that key in the lock, turned it, and the old oak door opened creaking, it was so rusty, it hadn't been open in years. And he opened the door, and as he opened the door, the music started. Oh, this was the most exciting day of his life. At last he can find what this music really is. And there was a passage in front of them. And they walked along that passage, there was another door. This door was a silver door, solid silver, worth a fortune if it was sold in any shop. And he got another key from the key ring, silver key. He put that in the keyhole, turned it slowly and opened that door. Now the music was even more clear. And this Australian, he was trembling. It was so, so thrilling and exciting. Like if ever you're about to find, not just find out the solution to a mystery, but see something which was incredibly beautiful, more beautiful than you've ever experienced in your whole existence. And they walked down the second corridor. At the end of that corridor, what you'd expect, a golden door. 
made of solid gold. Again, just if you could take that away, you never need to work ever again. And you could, you can build meditation retreat centers in every state of uh, Malaysia. And the golden door was also encrusted with precious jewels, with diamonds and rubies. I was just, this was something really special. And he could hear the sound of the music even more clearly. It was just the other side of the door. So the monk got out the third key made of gold. And he put it in the lock, but before turning it, he looked around at this Australian, now a monk, and said, look, I have to ask you, are you really sure you want to witness this? This is something which will really just, they say, blow your mind, it's so fantastic. And said, many monks couldn't stand it. So I have to ask you, do you want me to open that door? And the Australian really thought about that. He said, yes, please, I've come so far, open it. So the abbot turned the golden key in the lock and opened the door. Wow! What they saw was out of this world. Most beautiful, amazing, supernatural thing you could ever imagine. You know what it was? I'm sorry, I can't tell you. <laughs> You're not a mouse. <laughs> oh yeah, but he's got to keep it quiet. <laughs> had you heard that story before? Oh, some of you had. <laughs> Thank you for behaving and not spoiling it for those who haven't heard it before. The curiosity, we just want to know, even though it's got nothing to do with us, even though it's just not important. Still, you know, I've told that story for so many years that some people have actually written to me, email, where is that monastery? Can I go there? <laughs> <laughs> but it's a story about curiosity. And you build it up. Why do you need to know everything? Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's more peaceful. Not to know, but to know how this mind works, it has this craving to know things which are none of its business and don't need to know. In the suttas, the Buddha picked up that uh, handful of simsapa simsap leaves. And he said to the monks, which are more, the leaves in my hand or the leaves in the forest? It's obvious, the leaves in the forest are much more than the leaves in your hand. And he said, that's just like what I have taught you compared to what I know. I've only taught you a fraction of what I know. And the reason I haven't taught you all the other things is because all the other things have nothing to do with enlightenment, with the path. Everything which you need to know, that's what I've taught you. And I thought that's a brilliant um, example, because it shows, yes, there's things which the Buddha never taught, which he knew, but which are not important. The important things, the Eightfold Path and how to practice it, that's what the Buddha did teach. And there's so many other knowledges People ask the monks, I don't know if you, they've asked you, Venerable Kaisi, about what's the economy going to be like. You know, to do. <laughs> How do we know? I'm not an economist. Or what your future is going to be like. I don't predict the future. Do I? 
Ajahn Chah predicted the future. It was amazing. Ajahn Chah, an enlightened monk, and he actually predicted how this world is going to go. Are you interested in knowing? Of course I won't tell you, you're not monks. <laughs> no, there was a man who came up to him and said, Ajahn Chah, please read the lines on the palm of my hand to tell me what my future is going to be. And Ajahn Chah said, no, I don't do things like that. And the man was prepared with his counter-argument. He knew that was what Ajahn Chah was going to say. So he said, I have given you dana. I have fed you, given donations from any project you need to do. I have spent hours away from my work and family, driving you here, driving you there on your duties. I've helped you so much. This is the first time I've asked you for anything. And you give talks on gratitude and respect. Come on, Ajahn Charles, show some gratitude. Read the lines on the palm of my hand. It's a very hard thing for a monk when they say, show some gratitude, because that's what we teach. So how's Ajahn Chah going to react? He said, okay, give me the, uh, your hand. And so Ajahn Chah took this man's hand, and Ajahn Chah started tracing the lines on the palm of his hand. This man was so excited. He knew this was the only time that Ajahn Chah had read the, part, the lines on someone's palm to tell their future. This was special. And Ajahn Chah asserted, I am a monk, I will not tell a lie. Whatever I tell you, you can trust, will be certain. Imagine a holy monk said that to you. Oh. And as Ajahn Chah was tracing the lines on this, monk, this man's hand, every now and again he would stop. And he would look, really concerned. That really scared this man. But then he continued on, oh, okay. Wow, that's interesting. Oh, and this man was getting more and more and more excited. And then eventually Ajahn Chah finished. And the man couldn't stop himself. What's my future going to be? What's my future going to be? Sir, calm down. But what's going to happen? I know you, you, you can see it. What's going to happen? And Ajahn Chah said very slowly, Sir, I've read the lines on the palm of your hand. Yes, yes, I know. What's going to happen? What I'm going to say is true. What I predict is going to happen. Yeah, I know. What is it? And very slowly, Ajahn Chah, looking in his eyes, said, Sir, your future is uncertain. <laughs> <laughs> and Ajahn Chah wasn't wrong. 100% right. <laughs> so, do you want to know your future? <laughs> uncertain. I love stories like that. Just, oh, please, I can't stop myself when I get into storytelling. This was the story of the, again, another monastery in the foothills of the Himalayas. Not the first one, but another one. And the old abbot had passed away. And you know this one as well. How many know this one about the old abbot who passed away? The previous abbot, the head monk, so the previous abbot had been really good at predicting things like weather. So usually at the start of the winter season, maybe October, 
the monks would ask him, is it going to be a cold winter next year? And the abbot would go into meditation and afterwards when he came out of meditation, the abbot was always correct. If he said it was going to be cold, it was cold. If he said it was going to be mild, it would be mild. If he said it's going to snow a lot, it would snow a lot. So the monks relied upon him. And when he died, they asked the, the next monk, the new abbot, is it going to be cold this year? We need to know because we have to collect all the wood from the forest and store it up to keep our monastery warm. There was no electricity. They had to make wood fires to keep it warm. So the abbot said, leave it with me. I will tell you tomorrow morning. So the abbot meditated. But unfortunately, it wasn't that good. <laughs> he fell asleep, his mind wandered. I think you know what it's like. <laughs> so when he came close to the morning, he hadn't got an answer. He didn't know how the previous abbot did it. But anyway, no answer, so what did he do? He had a mobile phone. He rang out the weather bureau. <laughs> and he managed to get through to the head of the weather bureau, a professor in India. And he asked the professor, he didn't say who he was, he said, uh, I'm an interested uh, resident up in north of India. Can you let me know the forecast, you know, up there for the next upcoming winter? And he, uh, the weather forecast, it was a bit early than mine, we're not really sure. Probably be just average. Thank you said the monk. And then when they met the younger monks that morning after breakfast, he said, I've got, he wasn't lying, he said, I have got the message that this year it will be average. But I think you should still collect a lot of wood just in case. So the monks went out for the next five days into the forest, they collected so much wood and they stored the wood uh, in the uh, cupboards and stuff. And after five days of hard work, they asked the senior monk, is this enough? He said, leave it with me. I'll tell you tomorrow morning. And that night he never even tried to meditate. He just rang up the professor straight away. He said, How's it been going? What's the weather forecast for that part of the uh, Himalaya foothills? And the professor said, oh, glad you called. Because all the signs are, it's getting worse. It's probably going to be a cold winter. Thank you. So the next morning he told all the monks, I have seen that it's going to be a cold winter. You better get out and collect some more wood. So all the monks were collecting more wood. And when they'd worked so hard and stored the wood everywhere, they asked, is it enough yet? And the senior monk said, leave it with me, I'll tell you tomorrow morning. And tomorrow morning, or that early that night, he actually rang the professor. The professor still not, didn't know who he was. And the professor said, Ooh, it's amazing you've rang because it's got much worse. The signs are it's going to be really freezing in the next uh, winter time. Thank you. And then he told the monks the next morning, Ah, oh, just, I've heard you know, through amazing channels of communication. <laughs> He couldn't lie, he could sort of kind of deceive the truth a little bit. And he said, I've seen there's going to be a terribly cold winter. One of the coldest winters has ever been in the Himalaya mountains. He said, you better collect even more wood. More wood? The monk said, yes. And so they worked another sort of week collecting wood and storing it everywhere. 
And then the monk said, is that enough? Leave it with me. And that night, when no one was looking, he rang the professor again. And the professor said, I recognize your voice. Thank you for calling. He said, this is strange. But all the signs are the weather's going to be one of the worst winters ever experienced up in the Himalaya mountains. And the monk was about to say thank you. But then he asked, how do you know? And what sort of signs are there that you say with such certainty it's going to be a very, very cold winter? The professor replied, because, because all those monks in that holy monastery have been collecting wood like crazy. That's the signs we're following. <laughs> and when someone told me that story, they said, that's like how the stock market works. Why are these, <laughs> these prices for these goods going up? Because, <laughs> because the monks are buying them. <laughs> no, <coughs> it's, a, it's just a blind following the blind. Anyhow, these are things, the stories. Why do I like these stories and tell them? And it's because there's a lot of insight there into the nature of this world. And once you understand that insight, why we always want to find the most beautiful sound? Why are we sometimes... <laughs> sorry, I almost killed him. I do apologize for making you laugh too much. <laughs> Why do I tell jokes even? One of the reasons is behind every one of those jokes is some insights and dhamma. It presents it in such a way that you remember it and you want to come to the next Ajahn Brahm, a talk or a retreat. You enjoy it. When you come to the talks, it looks like everybody comes to the talk. They don't want to miss it. On some other talks, on other retreats, you'd rather not go, because it's boring. I remember as a young monk, no, not a young monk, a young man, being part of Buddhist societies, and hearing these talks by these very renowned monks and professors, they sent me to sleep. Does Buddhism need to send you to sleep? Wasn't it nice that it inspires you, gives you stories you remember, you know, not just to believe and because monks keep <laughs> collecting wood, there's going to be a cold winter. Once you understand the nature of humanity, the nature of delusion even, it makes you far more wise in your life. Yes, you can start to see those bigger insights as well. One of the things about, well, what are those three characteristics of existence? Anicca. Ajahn Shah would always tell me, that don't think Anicca is impermanence. It's much closer to uncertainty. That's a legitimate translation of Anicca. Not reliable, not regular. And I imagine if you understood, understood that, everything in life, is uncertain. The future will always be uncertain. That has lots of consequences to it. One of those consequences, uh, even when I was a layman, I never trusted politicians who promised to do this and do that in the future. They were being dishonest. I don't know what the future is going to hold. How would a politician know? what's going to happen. Instead of promising this and promising that in the future, I always remember in Rome, it was a great empire, and the Roman Empire, they elected people not on what they promised to do for the future, 
but only their record in the past, how they handled difficulties and unexpected things occurring. If they handle those things well, then they are considered to be competent and elected again. Now you have companies. If you're going to elect a CEO of the company, it's on your past behavior, your past um, experience, not on future promises. So when you understand how uncertain things are, you don't need to actually to listen to people's promises. The same, please excuse me, with doctors as well. They say, oh, you've only got so six months to live. You know that old story, this person was told he, uh, he was going to die soon. How long have I got to live? And the doctor said, 12. 12 what? Years? Months? Days? And the doctor continued, 11, 10, <laughs> 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. But every doctor knows that it's, it is uncertain. It's an average. No one can really know the date and time of death. And that's the sort of thing which, as a scientist and as a Buddhist, you can combine so beautifully. All you do is you make sure the causes, say of health, are looked at, increased, cared for, and you know you're going to live a reasonably long life. The same as meditation. Many of you have been thinking probably, this is almost the end of the retreat, it finishes tomorrow lunchtime. Ah, I haven't got anything yet. No limiters, no jhanas, no insights. Ah. Exactly. <laughs> <coughs> but the point is, all the deep meditations come at the most unexpected times. I should have told you this way of meditation at the beginning, because I think you might like this way of meditation. It's very easy and highly effective. It was how Venerable Ananda became fully enlightened. Venerable Ananda, he was the attendant of the Buddha. He'd heard so many talks, so many instructions, the best you could possibly hear. And he saw many of his friends coming up listening to the Buddha and coming up later on fully enlightened, even with psychic powers. And Ananda had been helping and looking after the Buddha all that time. Just like Chao Po looks after me. <laughs> and Chao Po thinks, oh my goodness, I'm not in line, Jero, what's going to happen to me? We've had Ajahn Brahma and Kaisi with me for the last, I don't know how many days, and still not in line, though I'm hopeless. That's what Ananda felt like. When the Buddha passed away, Ananda still wasn't in line. What hope was there for him now? And then they had this big convention. They wanted to get all the senior monks together to collect all of the um, memories of Dhamma. So they invited 500. They wanted 500. Who would you invite? Only the enlightened Sangha. Just enlightened monks and nuns, no one else. They chose 500 as the limit. 499 of those were fully enlightened. The 500th one was Venerable Ananda. He wasn't enlightened, but he had heard so much. He'd been with the Buddha as his attendant for the last 25 years of the Buddha's life. They said they needed him there. So they gave him a special invitation. 
You know you're not enlightened, but please come. And imagine what that must feel like. Imagine you're the odd one out. Everyone else, all your friends and colleagues are enlightened except for you. Imagine tomorrow I gave the announcement that every one of you, every one of you were fully enlightened, had a wonderful retreat, everyone except for you. <laughs> how would you feel? Oh, that is really hard. That's how Ananda felt. He'd have to show up at a meeting, but all his friends were fully enlightened except for him. He felt such a failure, such a disappointment. So what did he do? Let's give him one last chance. The night before the meeting, he meditated. He really meditated. He sat and he sat and he sat. Even though he was tired and exhausted, he sat and he sat and he sat. And in the morning when he opened his eyes, he was still unenlightened. Poor Ananda, he really felt sorry for him. He helped so many people, but he couldn't help himself. So what would you do? You have an hour before this meeting began, he was really exhausted, disappointed, so he decided to go and take a nap. Went to his room to lay down, just for 45 minutes. And, as all of the teachings, all of the recorded suttas say, just, just before his head hit the pillow, he became the 500th Arahat. He became fully enlightened. Why? Because now he let go. He'd been chasing that carrot or that durian in the donkey story. You remember that one I told you? He'd been chasing that durian all night. And now he stopped. The durian went away and then came right back into his mouth. The 500th Arahat. And just to make sure that he could impress everybody else, that they would know he was fully enlightened. He deliberately came into the meeting late. All the doors were locked. So he came in through the keyhole. It's called making an entrance. <laughs> And to this day, I call that the Ananda method of meditation. You've heard about breath meditation, Vipassana meditation, Metta meditation. That's the Ananda method of meditation. If you're not enlightened yet, go to your room, <laughs> lay down. The more times you lay down, the higher probability that one of us. <laughs> Well, the time is going to work. <laughs> the, <laughs> the reason I say that is just the kindness to yourself. That's the one thing which a lot of time people forget to practice. The ingredient which many people miss or they undervalue. When you're sitting there and you're kind to your body and you're kind to the mind, what's the kindest thing you could possibly do to your mind? Become enlightened. Let go. Don't attach to anything. Leave it alone. And then beautiful peace and wisdom just come to you. You chase things all your life. It makes you very tired, frustrated and disappointed. But if you can learn how just to sit here and do absolutely nothing, be really peaceful, even if it may feel that you're getting tired, fine, it's just the nature of the body. The body will just energize itself afterwards. And then the mind becomes so still and so peaceful. 
And those stories, I hope you remember them, of the mango orchard. You just sit under the mango tree, really still, hold out your hand and a mango falls right into it. Brilliant simile from Ajahn Chah on how enlightenment happens. That's why we meditate, sit still, expecting nothing in the whole world, just happy to be still. They have another saying which I always value. When you want something more, you cannot enjoy what you already have. Very simple piece of wisdom. Okay, you have to work, you have to put in some effort sometimes, but not all the time. How about sometimes just relaxing? You work so hard in your life. Enjoy all of the results of all of your hard work. Now you're at peace. Enjoy that peace and see how deep that peace can become. And then you'll be able to see for yourself, hear for yourself, the most beautiful music in the whole world behind the golden door of a hidden monastery. whose nature I can't tell you, but it's true. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. <laughs>